I think it's a super interesting topic, and I think all, also the uh, I mean the speakings we just heard, all the viewpoints and perspectives on um, on it is really it, it's same same but different. And I think also when we look at Europe, we have a special challenge here, uh, which I'm going to talk a bit about. We're not Silicon Valley. I think we have some other strength. On the other hand, we got to speed up. I think uh, in the way we innovate. We innovate. So. I'll try to, sh to share with you some of the viewpoints that we, you know, me and my colleagues that we have on this uh, topic. And it seems that we're in a, it's kind of a new world order in a way. We see industry after industry, especially the old had ones, being basically turned upside down, being disrupted. Um, and it seems that everybody is competing against everybody somehow because of digital technology, right? You log into new... Uh, sectors, industries with uh, digital technology, bam, suddenly you compete with, you know, IKEA competing with uh, Sony or whoever eventually. Um, we work for a lot of uh, companies that uh, many of them are Europeans and of course they are worried about the future as well because cars are not cars anymore, cars are turned into mobility services, phones are not phones anymore, so what the hell are we going to do in the future, right? So, um, and I think what they all learned is that when it comes to corporate innovation, innovation th that you do in-house, it's slow, it's expensive, it's risky, right? So I think many of these um, companies also realized that, you know, way back when Apple and Blueberry were for fruits and we designed white teacups and design was all about beautification, things were so much easier, right? But suddenly... And I do agree with the Tim Brown that it's too important to be left just with designers because design is not design anymore. Design is the design of business. And that is why things become multidisciplinary and we increasingly hire people from business school, strategists, technologists, what have you. Um, and the, the, the big challenge that we kind of experience that all our customers are struggling with, it's logging in to the digital economy, no matter where they come from. And that is not only the, you know, the old classic uh, you know, manufacturing industry. It's basically everyone. And so this, I think, Rasmus, you mentioned it from Grundfos, the, 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 the fact about the digital value, the digital continuation, and so on. And that is really where, where, what we've got to look at today. And the big question here, let's see if we can answer it, is how can we make these big corporations act like startups, basically? I think that is what they're dreaming of. Many of them do so, start incubators, accelerators, labs, what have you. Uh, a lot of shoe boxes and sand boxes, etc. But really what they need is speed, they need the risk-taking, the mentality, everything that, I mean, those of you who are startups or, or entrepreneurs, founders yourself, I mean, that, that kind of runs in your veins, right? This feeling of, we want to go out there and change something. That is what you lose when you get big. You lose the ability to see opportunities, right? And believe in yourself. Um, Many of you know this TV drama, right? Huh? Can I raise some hands, please? Okay, good. So it, it's, I'm going to tell the story then. It's, uh, in Danish, it's Kroniken. It's uh, basically uh, you know, a story about... It's called Better Times, I think, in English. It's about um, you know, the advent of the whole you know, uh, um, consumer electronics industry, Bang & Olufsen, when that was uh, young and, and, and fledgling in Denmark. And this is uh, you know, the founder, Kai Holger. In Danish, it sounds like a very... You know, it's a tough name to have, right? I mean, he's pretty innovation resistant, I tell you. And the other guy there, it's uh, Eric. He just returned from the US. Uh, basically, his dad sent him away, not to learn new stuff, but just to get rid of him, right? So he comes back and tries to tell his dad that, you know, daddy, the business is changing. We're not going to do these, like, you know, uh, wooden boxes with, uh, with uh, you know, uh, like a TV screen in. Everything is going to change. And I think the discussion they had was about, um, you know, the transformation from black and white to color TV, right? But the thing here was, you know, the innovation-resistant guy, Kai Holger, he wanted to run the business. And Eric, 
he wanted to change the business, right? And I think still today, I mean, it's so, uh, I don't know what that syndrome or that diagnosis is called, but it's around still in so many big corporations. I wouldn't call it a big company disease, but I think it's still part of it. And it's, it's, it's kind of a roadblock, but it sits up here. Um, and it's easy for me to say this because I'm not the big risk taker in this, like a big multinational company. I understand why they are a bit, you know, um, like unwilling to, to, to risk because uh, there's a lot of stuff at stake. Um, and I think also we learned it the hard way uh, here in Copenhagen in Denmark, you know, the most innovative country in the world. Uh, we were one of the inventors of city bikes. I mean, early times, uh, you know, resource sharing, everything beautiful. Uh, 20 years ago, we were 20 years ahead of everyone. That's not the fact today, right? Other, you know, other uh, manufacturers, they put like some kind of digital back-end, front-end on the bike, and suddenly, you know, the bike system went from being a product, an iron horse in Denmark, uh, was turned into a service, right? A mobility service where you can collect data, you can have payment models, etc. So really, what you build on top of all this hardware, that is really what is interesting. Um, one of my favorite quotes, it's an old one by now, but I think it still holds some truth to it. You know, that was uh, Jeff Bezos basically uh, talking to, you know, the media and publishing industry. Everybody was shouting, you know, we're dying, we're dying, we're going to go out of business tomorrow. I know you're not, you're not going to die. You're going to turn digital. And I think that's a really good point. You can, you can apply that on any industry almost that has, you know, stock keeping units. You're not going to die, but you will turn digital. You'll change. And that goes in any sector that we know. I mean, doctors and patients are not going to you know, die either. They're going to be eye patients, eye doctors, and they're going to collaborate you know, via technology. So that is an... I mean, I, I see this, and I think most of you guys would agree with me. This is not a threat. It's an opportunity, right? We just got to tap into it somehow. Um, so what we need, I think, is a basic rethink. We see many of our customers, I mean, they're so obsessed with, you know, time to market, they're speeding ahead. So they go from, you know, they quickly define a challenge because our competitor has one that, you know. So they define the challenge, a problem. Sometimes it's wrong, but they don't have the patience to look at what, you know, the real problem is. So they speed ahead, focused on the time to market, end up with a solution, but it might be the, the beta max, basically, right? Because uh, you didn't spend time... Uh, figuring out what is the real problem. So what I think we need is a, is a basic rethink. And that is a very simple model, but it's a different mindset. Um, the famous fog. We, we, talk, we talk about the fog too, because when it comes to, to innovation, a lot of corporations, they have this feeling, sitting in a car, you have the steering wheel, you have control over your car, but you don't know where the hell you're going, right? Um, and they do like this, you know, make a small peephole, in order just to, you know, stay on the road, basically, right? A German client once told me, uh, after a speaking, he said, you might, you might be right on this, but, you know, we, we might be lost. We lost the sense of direction, but we're shooting ahead at a damn good speed, he said. Yeah, well, it's super cool, right? But where are you going? Uh, it's fast, but where are you going? And at other times, and I think, you know, our industry, the strategic creative industry with all its insights and stuff, you know, and sometimes also the reason why things move so goddamn slow is because we burden the companies, our clients, with too much information, right? And then you can add, like, marketing says, IT says, uh, consumers say, etc. And that is, that is the same thing. I mean, we're being lost in the fog. It's just, um, it's just an information fog, right? So... But many of our clients, they're really you know, also working with different agencies. They say, well, you tell us different things. It's left, it's right, it's left, it's right, and then we end up doing a U-turn. So maybe that's something for us to think a bit about, you know, when we advise our clients on, on getting more and better insights. And then just like uh, a thing that, you know, everybody knows that, you know, we're talking about the smarter future, right? And everybody knows we're not there yet. We want to go for the big, super high-tech solutions, right? But there's so much basic fixing that needs to be done before we can dream of a smarter future, smarter cities, smarter homes, etc. So, for example, take uh, you know security in the airport, right? How many of you guys uh, think it's a smooth uh, ride to get through then? Okay, no hands. Good, I'm glad. Um, and why? Because, you know, all these dudes that do, you know, the scanning technology and what have you, they think about one thing, it's the system, right? And security can't be safe. 
I really like to challenge that. I think security can be safe. And actually, if you would sit down and put you know, the users, the travelers first, you would have a smooth ride from land side to air side. But somebody said it's impossible. And I think we've got to change that. It's, it's a massive business opportunity to you know, connect all the dots in the world and uh, yeah, create a better future for everyone because I mean, there's so much friction. Um, and sometimes even you know, the solution becomes the problem, right? So uh, I didn't try that, but sometimes it feels like it just to get on Wi-Fi, right? Um, yeah, just some examples. I think that pretty interesting. I'm always, uh, like Enrique said, you know, that it kind of occurs to me that I always mention Facebook. I have the same feeling, you know, every time I pick a good innovation example, it's from the goddamn U.S., right? What's happening? But here are some from the U.S., and I've brought a couple of uh, European ones as well. But I think looking at, for example, Airbnb, I think that's a super interesting, uh, you know, phenomenon, basically. So it's the fourth most valuable hotel chain in the world now. They don't own hotels, but they have access to all the accommodation and homes that you can imagine in the world, right? That is pretty smart. Not owning anything, just like orchestrating the resources, right? Which is super neat. And I think also the fact that they are even moving beyond now saying it's not about the home, it's not about the accommodation, it's about belonging. You've got to belong somewhere. So it's more than just a home. So slowly they're changing, I think, the whole value proposition of, of the hospitality industry, basically. Um, another one is Uber. Uh, I still don't get it why it's so valuable, but it's, it's pretty smart too. I mean, orchestrating the world's biggest fleet, not owning anything, not, you know, fixing tires or anything. It's just there somehow, like a juggernaut, you know, connecting all the dots, etc. And uh, I guess that was small and ugly way back. I mean, everything big, you know, is born small and ugly. And I think also as a startup, you've got to think of, I mean, really believe in that idea. And, uh, you know, if, if that can grow so big, I mean, there's a lot of resources in the world that still needs uh, to be shared somehow. Um, yeah, and then the European example. Amazon does it as well, I know. But DHL, you know, the express logistics company, is also working on, uh, you know, using drones as, uh, as messengers. And that's going to be interesting what that's going to look like, you know, um, in the future with all these drones uh, flying around. So a bit of theory here, okay? Um, the way we look at it is um, this very you know, simplified model, but we, you know, way back we had the web, then came the iPhone, the whole touch generation, then came, read smack, uh, social mobile, analytics, cloud. We're looking forward to robotics and artificial int intelligence, etc. And what we see is happening really is that, you know, the techno technological opportunities, I mean, they're just speeding ahead. Everything can be done basically, right? With $100 software, a bit of Arduino programming, and here you go. And then, you know, the strategic design demand from the customers is slowly following. It's way behind because they're not asking for actually all the super stuff that could be done. And then our industry, the creative industry, we're down here. There's just too little supply of this. There's a lot of classic, old-fashioned, sorry for the word, uh, design agencies that want to make the white teacup still. But uh, we need it. we got to move up because that's where the big market is, really. And um, you can put it like this. Right there is the sweet spot, you know, between endless technological opportunities and then this big strategic design demand. Uh, for example, if you want to make a digital showroom for your customer, right? That's right in that spot, you know, with Kinect and everything, and maybe even take it further into, um, you know, some of the upcoming areas like artificial intelligence, robotics, etc. So, um, way back in Fast Company, I read this uh, quirky story about maybe Apple wanted to go into consumer banking, right? Which I think was kind of a, a neat story. We told it to some of the banking clients we have, and they were kind of, you know, spitting out their coffee because, is that right? No, it's not right. Probably not. But, but imagine if Apple would go into that, right? With its technology, its sublime, you know, connectedness, user experience, etc. Would be the best bank in the world. Maybe the most wealthy one as well. So that actually, that, that sparked a lot of conversation at Design It. And we, we kind of, you know, um, uh, thought of what would happen actually if, um, as rumored, you know, Apple would buy Tesla. What would that be like a big iPhone on wheels or whatever? But basically, that would spark a whole new product category, wouldn't it? I mean, it's not a car, it's not a phone, it's just like uh, technology and wheels. Um, 
So I think when we talk about strategic design and, and innovating, it's always about looking you know, a bit ahead, what you read in the papers, but also dream a bit and, and start imagining um, you know, what is this landscape going to look like in the future. So if we look a bit at the car industry, which is undergoing a lot of change because of the car share and technology, etc., I think some companies are doing really great. Uh, I know Uber is, is, is a case uh, you know, by itself, but take BMW working with Sixt on these minute-based uh, car share services. It's super cool. Uh, in Munich, for example, where we have an office, uh, it's, it's hugely popular. I think about 1,000 cars replacing 10,000 commuting cars. So I use that every time I'm there. You know, you have the app, you have the car, and off you go, basically. Um, and then, talking about the future of cars here, uh, the driverless cars, I think it's super fascinating, and I'm going to tell you why in a minute. But for a while, for a couple of years, we just had this notion that, you know, when we get the driverless cars, the self-driving cars, we, we're just going to, like, early BMW vision, we're just going to sit there, right? Oh, hands off the steering wheel, and we're just going to, like, travel without, you know, uh, managing the car at all. But, of course, we're not going to sit just like this, right? Um, Tesla would, right now, it's about, like, putting a, a double-size iPad into, you know, the dashboard. Is that going to be the future? I'm not sure about it. Um, if you ask uh, Regis, um, you know, the, they rent out these uh, temporary hotel spaces, and um, th that is their vision of the car in the future, right? So, and I think what's interesting about what they're doing is they're trying to figure out what are we going to do in the car in the future, right? Because if it drives by itself, what the hell are we going to do? Pure leisure, hotel chain on wheels, whatever. And what it really brings me to is um, another model that we, uh, we're working on is... Technology automizes more and more our homes, our cars, etc. So we just basically we could lie in our beds every day, and things would get just get done right. That is super cool, and it's getting easier as well. While we are getting better and better at things, somebody said this about you know the a touch kit is better with more tech literate than a forty five year old, right? So what the hell are we gonna do? I mean, things are automated. And we can do, we can fly a spaceship, basically. Um, so that is really where we got to create the new user experience. It's just like Simona told us about. I mean, in this, that's a massive opportunity space, right? We free up so much time, uh, and I want to I have part of that time with my customers. And then just um, some quick slides on the self-driving car, because I think... When you discuss that with, uh, with people and also with our clients, they say, yeah, we know about the self-driving car. It's probably going to come and it's, it's going to be great, etc. It looks a bit quirky. Yeah, you're right, but you don't. I mean, just like in a game of chess, you've got to think further down the road what's going to happen, right? For example, self-driving cars, they, we wouldn't need street lighting, right? What about the thousand kilos of extra material just used for safety? You can take that out, right? And another guy told me once, he said, yeah, hell, what's Volkswagen and all these big car makers going to do? He was from the car insurance industry and just like pondering a bit. And he said, yeah, hell, what are we going to do? Maybe Google is going to take over, you know, the insurance, uh, you know, market. Or if they don't bump into each other, we just don't need it anymore. But I think the smart thing here is really, uh, that's one of our favorite, you know, what we keep babbling about the fusion of products and services, right? And if you imagine that Google would, you know, fooling around with robotics, cars, and all this hardware, Nest, etc. Um, you add the location, you know, all the location-based technology on top of it, and a bit of voice recognition and so on. There you have it, right? It's, 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 a, it's a total game changer, if you ask me, because, uh, and that is hard to copy, right? Even for a super smart Chinese company, you can copy the car, you can copy some of it, but getting the whole thing together, uh, that's a tough one. And just um, another example, a European one, pretty proud of that. It's uh, car drops. How many of you know that? Okay, sure, I'm going to speed up then. Good. It's basically a smart trunk. You use your car. It's a shipping method. You just like what you order online, you just drop it in the car. Okay? So now hold on to your chairs. Now it's going to be really fast, okay? Good. Uh, here's some things we found to be true. The shift from you know, product first to people first. Carlson SAS said it beautifully way back. We're damn good at flying planes. We should get damn good at flying people. Um, we should go from analyzing product specs to really caring much more about visualizing consumer expectations. It's not a thermostat. It's a data collector, right? 
And those of you who think of entering this game, I mean, don't end up at just like an empty shell just being a host for uh, you know, Google services, for example. Wake up, it's gonna come pretty soon. And cross over sometimes, don't, get, um, don't be so dependent on your track or your trail, whatever you, you stick to. Remember that design is not a decoration thing, it's a foundation thing. And watch out for the blind angle in the rear mirror. And this one, that's why I, why I sped it up, because I wanted to share this one with you. Gillette should think of this, okay? Hi, I'm Mike, founder of DollarShaveClub.com. What is DollarShaveClub.com? Well, for a few dollars a month, we send high-quality razors right to your door. Each razor has stainless steel blades, an aloe vera lubricating strip, and a pivot head. It's so gentle a toddler could use it. And do you like spending $20 a month on brand name razors? 19 go to Roger Federer. I'm good at tennis. And do you think your razor needs a vibrating handle, a flashlight, a back scratcher, and 10 blades? Your handsome ass grandfather had one blade and polio. Looking good, pop up! Stop paying for shave tech you don't need. And stop forgetting to buy your blades every month. Alejandro and I are gonna ship them right to you. So stop forgetting to buy your blades every month and start deciding where you're going to stack all those dollar bills I'm saving you. We are DollarShaveClub.com and the party is on. Thanks a lot.